Great. Well, thank you everyone so much for being here and being on time. Like I said, I, I, <laughs> I have to say hi to Kristen. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will continue to admit people as they trickle in, um, and I would love to just start with introducing Lisa to everyone. Thank you so much, Lisa, for being here. I'm really excited for this conversation. Um, so Lisa Diamond, class of 1989. Oh, and just to quickly introduce myself so you know who's talking, I'm Natalie Macasquadro. I'm part of the class of 2009, and I am now the Associate Director of Alumni Engagement here at Marlboro. So I'll be talking with Lisa tonight. Um, so Lisa Diamond, our guest, is a distinguished professor of psychology and gender studies at the University of Utah. And she is the president-elect of the International Academy for Sex Research. For nearly three decades, she has studied the development and expression of gender and sexuality across the life course. Her current work focuses on the biobehavioral mechanisms through which social stigma, social stress, and social safety shape the health and well-being of sexually diverse and gender diverse individuals at different stages of development. Dr. Diamond is best known for her research on sexual fluidi fluidity, which describes the capacity for individuals to experience unexpected shifts in sexual identity and expression over time. And her 2008 book, Sexual Fluidity, published by Harvard University Press, has been awarded the Distinguished Book Award from the APA Society for the Study of LGBTQ Issues. Dr. Diamond is also the co-editor of the first ever APA Handbook of Sexuality and Psychology, published in 2014. And she's published over 140 articles and spoken at over 150 national and international universities. So I'm very excited to talk to you today. I mean, the accolades go on and on. Um, I'll let you further introduce yourself and share kind of all of the stuff that you've been up to since Marlboro. Thank you so much. It's, uh, it's so fun to be here. And I, I like, I'm not going to show you slides. I want this to be more like a conversation because I, I almost feel like I just feel like there's no one I would rather have this conversation with than, you know, the people that remind me of, you know, kind of how I even got here because it, it's a sort of strange and funny, like sequence of events uh, that no one can predict. And, and I feel like it's a perfect prelude for sort of talking about what I've started working on, you know, in most recently, which I feel like is the passion of my life right now. Um, and all came about because like I had a total nervous breakdown during the pandemic, <laughs> like out of the ashes, out of the ashes, the phoenix arises. Um, so uh, I was class of 89 and, uh, and some of y'all are here and these were pre-internet days, you know, the, the way we talk about you know, just sexuality and relationships now, there's just so much more much more information you know available and so because i'm a lesbian people are always like oh like you know first of all it's like you went to an all-girls school so there's like that whole like awkward thing that i like have to be like you know what i think the co-ed schools are producing plenty of lesbians i don't think we can tie it to marlboro um and and they're like you know so like was high school hard and i was like I just literally don't even remember ever asking myself, what do you desire? Like, I was so completely dissociated that the question, who are you attracted to, literally never occurred to me. It, I just was, come and, and I'd forgotten some of these details, and I think it was Janice Kim, you know, who I've known since I was uh, five years old. Um, who went in elementary school and then we went to Marlboro together. And, you know, we were like, we were talking at some point many years later and she said, you told everyone in 10th grade that you were never going to get married because you were going to live the life of the mind. <laughs> and I was like, well, that is a fantastic defense mechanism. <laughs> I'm so proud of myself. Um, so I had no awareness at all of anything about my sexuality. Um, except for the fact that I thought that it was a nullity, that I just, you know, and that was fine. Like I had no kind of problems with that. And there was actually like a health day once where all of us were in the senior uh, library and they were like talking about birth control and stuff like that. And they had divided the class into small groups, you know, that it wasn't everyone, it was just, you know, pieces. 
And whoever the health teacher was, was like leading this discussion. And at some point she says, you know, and some of you may find that, you know, you're attracted to women and, you know, that's okay too. And that, that's okay. And I remember thinking, wow, that's so nice of them to say for any lesbians that are here. Like, what a positive message that is. Good for you, Marlboro, for those sad, sad lesbians who must be here, but they're not me, right? So I was completely uh, uh, disassociated and um, went to University of, but, but still had a boyfriend and that was part of it because um, that whole experience was just a singular shutdown that lasted for many years. Um, so by the time I got to college, that broke up, I could start my new life. I fell deeply in love with my roommate, Angie Mim. In our first year, we became totally best friends. And when I was picking a major, I wanted to major in anthropology because I loved like social constructionism and you know feminist anthropology. But then Angie said she was gonna major in anthropology. And I thought it would be bad for our friendship if we had the same major, because I came from Marlboro, where that's like a thing, you know? It was an issue between me and Charmaine that we were both in theater and we had to like negotiate that in our friendship. I didn't want, you know, any of that. It stressed me out so much with Charmaine. I'm like, I'm not gonna like lose, you know, another like emotional life partner, you know, by competition. So I switched to psychology and now I have a career right in psychology. So when the undergrads are like, how did you get into this? I'm like, well, you know, I'm not saying it was random, but it, you know, was, it was never anything that I really sort of expected. Um, and so then I uh, came out in college and ended up going to graduate school at Cornell to study this emerging blossoming field, which had only really cropped up in the um, late 80s, early 90s, lesbian and gay youth. And at that time, that's all they were. There was no B or T or Q. It was lesbian and gay like youth. And there were very, very few studies of them. And I was just like fascinated by this because some of these kids were, you know, struggling in high school. And yet I had not, like, I had just been like mind, meat, body, separate. And, and so I was just fascinated by this question of the development. Like, what was hap like, what happened to me? How did I get here? What, you know, what's going on when you're 12, 13, 14, 15? So I just found that personally kind of fascinating and there was not very much research on it. And, and I'm like looking around for graduate programs and there, there were like, there were only two people in the country who were studying lesbian and gay youth. And one of them was Rich Seven Williams at Cornell University. And the other was Gilbert Hurt, who was a professor in the anthropology department at Chicago that I you know had classes with and I was like, well, these are my only two options. Like nobody else is studying this. So I, I go to Cornell or I stay here. And I felt like Gilbert Hurt was a better match, but I was breaking up with my first real partner. And, and I needed to leave Chicago. I like needed, I was like, if I stay, even though that's a better degree program, I will have to deal with the fallout of this relationship, which is complicated because I'm the one who wants to break up and we're still living together while I'm applied to graduate school and it's super awkward and I need to get out of here. And so it's like, these are decisions that at the time you're just kind of going by the seat of your pants, you know, but then they have these life altering, you know, consequences. So I go to, um, I'm now so glad I didn't stay in Chicago to do Gilbert Hurt. It was just a different program of research. Go to Ithaca, to work with Rich Evan Williams, the only person you know who can work with. And within one week of arriving in Ithaca, New York, I meet my wife, Judy. 
who I've now been with for 28 years. And so we met literally the first week that I landed in Ithaca. And the funny thing about Ithaca is that it's really, it's really small. It's very progressive. So it's like, a, it's got like a high lesbian to population ratio. And, but like, it's a small community. So within like a month of meeting Judy, I pretty much met all of the other available women in the entire town. And I was like, damn, I got the best one, right? <laughs> and I sort of feel like we were just, we were gonna find each other. I never feel like, oh, what if we haven't met? We were gonna meet, it's a small area. And so it was while I was at uh, graduate school that I started working on what would become sort of my life's project, which is this notion of sexual fluidity, that sexual orientation doesn't develop in such a rigid deterministic pathway that you show signs by age 12, and then you do this, and then you do this. I had seen too many women's trajectories that just didn't look like that, you know, of just the women that I was meeting as a member of, you know, the queer community in Chicago. Uh, it's just, I was like, and, and, and yet there had never been a single study of sexual identity development in women, not a single one. Most of the studies were based on um, samples that you would collect by going to like the gay community center or the gay bar. And there were just fewer women in those settings in the uh, uh, late eighties and early nineties. So every single coming out model was based on men, men who were going to the bars. And I found this one study, you know, lesbian identity development, it had like six people and it was like in the eighties. And I was like, well, I guess what I'll just do is be a good feminist and put women back in the model by just finding a bunch of women to talk to me about how they got to where they are. And I had no money, I had no budget. Uh, normally graduate students have like their, their advisors money to work with, you don't have any money. So I just literally, I bought a used car, I bought a 1989 Toyota Corolla and I would just drive around the state of New York to any place that seemed to have a reasonably large gay community like Rochester and Binghamton and Elmira and all these towns, Syracuse and go places, Judy and I, Judy, you know, would help me out. We would just go to like pride parades, community centers and just advertise the study. I have no money to pay you. I don't know what I'm looking for. I'm just interested in talking to young women who are somehow not straight. And I didn't make them identify. I'm like, I don't care what you identify as. I'm just looking for women who are interested in women or have been with women. Doesn't matter how you got there. And, you know, they had all these fantastic uh, different trajectories. And so that was my master's thesis. And then what I ended up doing was just, and there was about a hundred women that I drove around the state interviewing in person and they did it for no money, you know? And um, I then started following them every two years. And this had never been done with women before. Normally when it's like, you know, how many gay people are there? Like, are you gay now? And it's like 1989. But if you follow the same people over time, what I ended up finding in my data is that there was a hell of a lot of movement. Some of the lesbians, you know, from time one, by two years later, they were identifying as bisexual. Some of the bisexual women identified as lesbians the next time. Some of the lesbians stopped labeling their identity altogether and said, I don't have a label, I don't even know anymore. And that became, you know, what I then ended up writing a book about in 2008, because by that point, I had 10 years of data and I followed these women, these nearly, I, I kept most of them, I kept about 83% of them over, it's now been almost 30 years. I'm actually trying to I'm like come up with a proposal to Netflix because I want to make, like in my fantasy, I would love to, I've never seen these women since that first interview. I haven't seen them in 30 years. I would love to go to visit them, bring them all of their interview transcripts, you know, because I was asking them about who they loved and who they were attracted to and their breakups and their heartbreaks and their marriages and their divorces, because I would just keep back in touch with them every two to three years. 
And I was like, I want to put these women's voices back into a book and give it back to them. You know, it's like a part of their past. And I was, and then once I had this idea, I'm like, that's so fantastic. I'll probably be crying the whole time. And it's really meaningful because this was an important period of history when the gay movement really changed. And I was like, that should be a, and that, I would watch that show, you know, like some of these women have changed genders. You know, it's, it's just amazing. Some of them are poly. There's just like every trajectory you can imagine. And I felt like just the un unbelievable, you know, insights into these women that's really, really been inspirational. And that has sort of made me think about uh, the importance of sort of making more publicly known the message to all kids that, yeah, your sexuality is sometimes it's gonna change. And that shouldn't terrify you. And it doesn't mean you were lying or deluded the first time. It doesn't mean you're depressed or repressed. Sexuality is a dynamic system. It is not a point. It's, it's, a, it's a sine wave, you know, spiraling forward. And every single input you have as a human being is going into that, you know, psychobiological whirlpool and you are creating yourself as you go. And you're going to have some things that are really, really stable in your sexual patterning and some things that will not. And neither of those is you and neither of them is delusion. There's just a lot we don't understand about how this stuff unfolds. But there's one thing we do know practically every type of trajectory you can imagine is out there. And so just getting the message out about just developmental diversity. So, because I know that what a lot of kids face um, about sexuality is this sense from parents that is this a phase. And, and so I will accept you now only if you can promise me that the package you're giving me now, the thing I'm accepting, it's like, it's like a bargain. I'll accept this as long as this is now predictable and stable. Don't you throw any more development, you know, at me. And then what was all that support for? And I've heard parents say that. What was, what was it for to go to the, you know, PFLAG meeting for my bisexual daughter now that she's marrying a man. What was all that for? And the fact that it does not occur to those parents to think, what was it for? It was for, you know, showing your daughter that you like, no matter what she brings to you, you're ride or die and you're going on a journey with her. And that there's only one version of her that's acceptable is the message you give instead. And uh, and for a lot of women, you know, those are lingering hurts and, and wounds that there's only one type of me that's acceptable. Women who came out um, lesbian and ended up with men, sometimes 15 years later, would feel like they were betraying, you know, the sisterhood or like I'm letting people down as if the possibility that you had no fear for social disapproval of anything that you could really count on all your friends to love all of you, that that didn't even seem to occur to them. The notion that it was, it was like, whether you are, are lesbian, bisexual, straight, the moment you start to feel that the love and the support and the safety provided by other people is dependent on you being only one version of yourself one very specific version, that's what is kind of soul crushing, you know, for kids. Um, and so I feel like, you know, that's why parents need to realize, like, there's no need for you to distrust your kids because their sexuality seems to change or their gender nowadays suddenly is changing. You know, I hear a lot of parents who are like, I don't know what this non-binary thing is. Everyone is doing it. It's a social virus. It's a TikTok trend. It's a this, it's a that, it's a this. And, um, and to sort of calm everybody down, 
you know what I often say to these parents is like, let's all just slow down. There is no epidemic of like gender quite like there are no epidemics here. Um, are more and more kids questioning what they actually feel inside of their bodies younger and younger? Yes, that is definitely happening. They're not reliant on getting to college to find out, you know, about how other people feel about their gender. They can see it on TikTok. They can see non-binary television characters. And, you know, so it's, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, people who had these more diverse sexual expressions were always around. They just had sort of different identity groups and different affiliations, you know. A lot of the folks that, you know, when I was coming out in Chicago, that, you know, some people would call the, the stone butch lesbians. Um, now, mo most of them now identify as trans men. So they were always there. They just didn't have a social category. So nothing's changing in the population. What's changing is the ease of expression and the access to the kind of information that can allow you to be like, Oh my God, is that what it is? Oh my goodness. And it's also interesting that when you see these upsurges in kids identifying as non-binary, there's also an upsurge in other sort of corners of the gender diverse committee, community who are always like, I always knew there was something not quite right about trans, not quite right about cis. Oh my God, there's a word for it, finally. And so it's not a developmental phenomenon of just experimentation. We have more language now that helps a broader swath of people kind of see themselves. And as a result, like even we as researchers, like I am no longer confident of what the natural distribution of the trait of sexual and gender identity really is, because the sort of social constraints we've had on the expression of those attractions and behaviors has been so strong and so reliable from the beginning of time that it's easy to just assume that, you know, this is what's biological, this is what's, you know, social, you know, whatever. But the radical sort of social and informational change that we've gone through in the past like 20 years it's almost like we're going on a big human experiment. Like what happens if you take the same group of people and then rapidly change just the availability to even find out that gay or trans even exists? Like I never even thought the thought like transgender, I think until I was like 19. You know, I don't know what it's like to have a brain that always knew that gender was flexible. I wonder what else in my brain would have changed because what we know about neuroscience is that the brain is pretty plastic. So it will obey the joints you give it earlier, especially if you keep recarving them. Uh, and gender is, and the gender binary and sexual binaries have been so long standing and they're so kind of prevalent. It's easy to think, well, they're always going to be there. But things are really like changing fast. I mean, the number of young kids who know like all of the options for a future life, that blows my mind. It literally blows my mind. And anyone who tells you that they know what that's gonna mean for the future is lying. Because I can tell you, nobody knows. It's like a big human experiment. Um, because maybe, sexuality and gender were always this complicated you know maybe it was always this multifaceted and and we just you know with our language and our categories we sort of changed what we were able to see and you know yeah so a, a big part of what i do is just try to get more information about that diversity out there the other um the downside of the work that i've done is that some people who want to practice conversion therapy on um, queer and trans kids will sometimes cite my book and cite my research as a justification for conversion therapy on the basis that 
if sexuality is fluid, if it changes over time, uh, then what's wrong with like giving it a little push in a certain direction? Like how bad can it be? Uh, you're not changing someone's sexual orientation, you're just kind of pushing it. And I totally disagree, uh, like from the, you know, from the tips of my hair to my toes, because everything we know suggests that the moment you introduce kind of shame and effort into a change, you know, a personality change, a change in your marriage, a change in your sexuality, a change in your gender, if you combine shame with effort, you know, and high stakes, you get serious emotional problems down the line, serious depression, serious suicidality, that change that is motivated by shame. And typically with conversion therapy, it's religious shame. Um, and effort, you are basically, that person is digging a hole in their own no soul. Um, so I've had a lot of weird back and forths over the years with conversion therapists. And when the same sex marriage uh, uh, Supreme Court decision was being debated in 2014, uh, the other side, the people who were against same sex marriage, when was John Boehner was was, you know, the head of that legal team. They submitted an affidavit using my work and using quotes from me to try to make the case that because sexuality was fluid, there is no defined population of LGBT people who are being discriminated against, you know, by not being able to marry. If it keeps changing, then who are these people? Who is this group? The Equal Protection Clause is supposed to protect groups. We know who Black people are. We know who, but you're giving us a group that isn't a group because Dr. Diamond says that it's not a group, so there's no basis for protecting their rights. And so that was like horrifying. I remember like reading that, someone emailed it to me, reading it in the middle of the night, being like, what the, you know, what? And I was allowed to submit an affidavit saying this is an improper use of my work, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, but that has really uh, made me much, much more aware of the social and political kind of implications of what I do. And I used to kind of shy away from that because I didn't want people to think that you know, I wanted, to, I wanted to have a reputation as a scientist, you know, not as an activist. Um, and, you know, now I'm just like, no, all activists all the time, sometimes with science, right? It's like, I just feel like the stakes are too high. We, there are um, so many legislative efforts that given what we now know uh, are so damaging to kids, just, I can't believe the, the 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 backwards that we're going with like the whole don't say gay bill and um, and efforts to, you know, keep conversion therapy for minors legal, which it, you know, just shouldn't be. And so I do a lot of work now, you know, over the years, because I've lived in Utah, like Utah of all places. And I've been here 22 years and I sort of feel like the ex-Mormons are like my people now. Like there, I have a whole research group of queer ex-Mormons, all of whom are now trying to understand exactly how that shame um, kind of gets under your skin and ends up altering your life chances. And so now I do a lot of, you know, kind of psychobiological research on how shame and exclusion uh, influence the immune system and actually cause the release of inflammatory chemicals. And systemic inflammation is the sort of word that's, it's just the immune system's response to injury. Um, and what we now know about the immune system that we didn't know 10 years ago is that 
The immune system treats social threats the same way it treats physical threats because humans evolved to be dependent on other humans. So the very first thing a child learns is what disapproval and anger look like. And there are, you know, uh, cells in the visual cortex that are wired for faces and that are ready to go. Uh, we're very sensitive to shame. You know, we are a social species. We cannot survive alone. And the brain looks to the faces of warm and inclusive social partners as the preeminent cue that you're safe, that you're okay. And so you can turn down all the hypervigilance in your brain and just be in the present moment. And when that is absent, when you do not feel like you have a protective social fabric, when you do not feel that someone would reach out for your hand if you tripped and started falling on your face, when you don't feel that you are being held to some degree by the basic human bonds of connection, that will actually produce systemic inflammation. We see it as in children who have been neglected and abused. Um, they've done experimental studies where they can increase your levels of inflammation by having you go through one hostile conflict with your spouse in the laboratory, and you'll see it in your bloodstream 24 hours later. And we now know that systemic inflammation is directly linked to about 50% of deaths worldwide. It is one of the greatest predictors of cardiovascular disease, of many cancers, asthma, arthritis, Alzheimer's, um, depression, suicidality. It's toxic to the brain. And so when it crosses the blood brain barrier, it, it has some toxicity and it's exacerbated by drinking and smoking. So if you have a population that's exposed to systemic exclusion and rejection, ethnic minorities, sexual and gender minorities, uh, Muslims in the US, if you are living, feeling that weight of shame and judgment, your body thinks you're about to be attacked. It thinks you're about to be stabbed, so it's getting ready. And over time, that is what leads to these health disparities. And all of the major health disparities that we see between LGBTQ populations and average populations, uh, higher rates of cardiovascular disease, higher rates of functional disability and all these other things, it doesn't happen right away. It happens usually after age 50 because it takes a while for inflammation to do its damage. And so what this really means and what I'm sort of obsessed with now and working on now is just this broader message that shame and isolation are literally public health emergencies. They're public health threats. We know the pathway through which, you know, the hostility and the judgment of others, we can now show how that gets under your skin and, and changes you. And that may also be a way to communicate with parents of queer kids who don't you know, accept them. It's like, let's not talk about acceptance. Let's talk about safety. You know, your kid's experience of unconditional inclusion in the social world of your family. Right now, they're not sure they're in. And so you can't even talk about what color you should dye your hair. Is everybody safe? Does everybody feel that that no one is at risk for disconnection? Because that's what all kids fear. And so if you just put the whole acceptance thing aside and just focus on safety, what's your first job as a parent? To make your kid feel safe. That means that in addition to not kicking them out, you don't look at them with scorn every time they go out with their same gender partner. Yeah, you haven't said anything rejecting, but your face tells them, you're not safe with me. And I feel like a lot of the literature on stigma and health focuses on the added stressors that you have in your life if you are a person who's in a minority group discrimination, mistreatment. And so we've spent all this time studying that. And what we're now realizing is that 
the absence of that protective feeling of people got me. Its absence is just as bad for us as the president, the presence of discrete stressors. That what, what lies at the heart of a lot of these health disparities is that when you're not safe, you are chronically vigilant and you're chronically afraid and you may not even know it consciously. It's like living your life like a clenched fist that you don't even realize and that most of us who are privileged never have to experience, you know, of like, oh, is that person looking like who's going to what, you know, that you're sleeping with one eye open, you know, all the time. And so we used to be thinking that that it was stress from discrimination that was really harming people's health, whether that stress came from economics, racial oppression, sexual oppression, that stress was the thing that made us sick. But humans evolved under conditions of stress. Humans are fine with stress as long as we have an equal or greater amount of safety, of knowing I am not alone, I have my people, there is no way I'm gonna disappear. You know, there's no way that something's gonna happen to me that someone won't make us think about. And so, yeah, we can reduce discriminatory laws and bad policies for queer kids. Yes, we should remove those additional stressors, but we have to aggressively amplify experiences of safety, social safety, that feeling of like, you know, what we all do without thinking of it, making eye contact with a stranger, checking in on your neighbors, that sense of we're all in this together. You know, you're a human, I am, I'm a human. You know, I like to think of it as like holding the elevator door, like when the, you're in the elevator and the doors are closing and then you see someone who's trying to catch the elevator and they meet your eyes. And once they meet your eyes, you're like, okay, like I'll let you in. That's that evolved wiring for, ah, connection, okay, you know, we need it, our brains need it. And so now I'm trying to do a bunch of studies aimed at measuring social safety in different groups. Where do they find it? What are the features of an environment that feels safe, you know, and, and how do we kind of capture that experience? It's a lot like mindfulness. Like when I would talk to LGBTQ, you know, research assistants, like how do we define this? And that the definition they came up with is that, you know, you're safe socially when you're with other people and you're so secure that you don't have to devote any thought or attention to monitoring what they are thinking about or saying to you, that you're just fully there in the present moment, which sounds a lot like mindfulness. And so we know that mindfulness changes your brain state. And I think what we're finding out is you cannot enter a mindful state unless you first have a, a foundation of social safety, right? In order for, your, for the human brain to be as creative and exploratory as it can be, that you know, safety is, is sort of like food or water. It's a basic human need. No one can create when they're afraid. No one can thrive in a state of fear. And that fear is not just really explicit fear, like someone's gonna attack me, but this very slow, low level vigilance of never quite knowing, are you totally okay? Are you totally okay? And and that low level vigilance, when extended over time, can be just as toxic to the brain and body as you know being bullied. You know, there's a lot of attention on bullying. The silent shame that some of the kids who have never been bullied are experiencing is just as much a threat to their health as what the kids who are being beat up are experiencing. And, and so we need to rethink who we, who we identify in school systems and communities as being at risk and who we need to pay attention to. And I think we should sort of really focus on, especially after the pandemic, you know, who is it that feels unsafe and uncertain and vigilant around us? Who might not know? 
that were there for them. How can we make it obvious, right? Um, what can we do in the workplace, at the school, in the way we talk to people that can make it absolutely clear, no, you are like, if you were falling down on the sidewalk, I would definitely grab you. Like, you're it. We're in the human family. And I think people with privilege, like myself, you know, skin privilege, uh, you know, class privilege, um, we are not aware of just what it is like to be chronically vigilant for signs of whether you're in or out. Um, and that now that we realize what an insidious toll that takes, I just feel like, well, that, you know, the good thing is, this is an easy problem to fix. Like, you know, I've started like now, I'm like aggressively making eye contact with strangers. I'm like, we all can give safety away. You know, every time, like now, like when I'm hiking on the trail and I see two people trying to take a safety, selfie, I'm like, do you want me to take a picture of you? I'd love to take a picture of you. I'm like, we're connected, we're connected. We're all together, together on the planet, right? And just that sense of, that's what we, that's not trivial. That's not niceness and it's not a side thing. I think one of the things we realized during the pandemic is humans need people, right? And some of the most fun interactions I think all of us started to have when we came out of the quarantine was seeing strangers. Like, remember strangers? You pass them on the street. And I think a lot of us would make eye contact with one another. That's just what we were born to do, to connect. And so I'm trying to get a lot of, you know, outreach activities for LGBTQ youth and other things. I'm trying to sort of go around to as many places as possible and say, let's think about this in terms of safety. Let's not think about this in terms of protecting kids from stressors. They're going to have them. Let's think about where are the pockets of unsafety that we can fill, and where are they, right? Is it the lack of an, of an identifiably, identifiably LGBT teacher at school? Is that where the hole is? Because sometimes all you need is like, where are the holes in safety rather than thinking about removing stressors? And that if you take that approach, if you manage to fill the safety gaps for the most vulnerable in our society, you'll probably do a pretty good job of making everybody in the community feel more interconnected and, and supportive. And this is a public health, you know, issue. And so, you know, I've had a really great time in the past year, just talking to a lot of folks about like, how to like, okay, what do we do with this now? So I'm trying to start something that I think is gonna happen at the University of Utah, because a fantastic experience I had uh, during the pandemic was I drove down to Provo, which is a really conservative and very Mormon part of the state of Utah. Uh, like, you know, very conservative. And there is an LGBTQ like uh, family support center in Provo. It's called Encircle. And it's like the Encircle Provo is like the port in a storm. Uh, for these families that that really struggle with the church's prohibitions on gender and sexual uh, diversity. And I went there and, and in their big meeting room, the walls were lined with these enormous, beautiful, black and white portraits of these different faces. And, and it looked like an art project, you know, and I was like, whoa, like, what are these? And they said, oh, these are a whole bunch of people who've used the house over the years. And we decided to get these done to showcase, you know, all the different kinds of people. We wanted everyone who walks in here to see someone that reminds them of themselves. And I just was like, oh, like, that's it. That's, that's what we all want, right? I belong here. And so I pitched to the vice president of equity, diversity, and inclusion at the University of Utah at a cocktail party, mind you. I pitched like, you know, what if in every single one of the buildings on campus, we have these enormous, like a similar thing, digital 
black and white, beautiful artistic portraits that look like an art installation. And, you know, it's just different. It's not like the sort of stupid diversity. It's like, let's show this person. It's like, you can't even tell what's going on, but every portrait would have a QR code and you could click on it and then it'd be someone like telling their story. Like I'm a first generation college student and I actually flunked out my first, and then I took some time off and then I came back and like to basically show like not just diversity and you know class race and all those things but just diversity in life circumstances of like i dropped out for two years and i came back because we have a lot of that we have refugee students just all these human stories all over campus right and they could change every year so that it would be like literally impossible to cross that campus and not have around you in the back of your mind and your visual field reminders that no matter how you're different there's probably someone else that kind of knows where you're at you just cannot escape the reminders that you're included you know and i was like you know because i found out that it would cost like two hundred thousand dollars so i'm like and it would only cost like two hundred thousand dollars and that doesn't count the medical campus but she was like oh i we can find a donor i know we can do it and I'm like, like, are, are you serious? Like, we're going to make this happen. She's like, oh, we, you know, we're going to do this. And I'm talking to my RAs. I'm like, we are going to like change the safety infrastructure of this of this campus. And so now I'm like, that is like the fun that I feel like I'm having at this point in my career. I'm like, I could write this or that, but like, let's change the world. <laughs> like well, let's pull on this lever over here and i think when i was younger i'm like oh it's just at the university level but you know what like start local you know it's like i've grown to love utah i've grown to love the university it's like well of course i want to spend my efforts making that university feel like a better you know place uh utah is a, a, can be a tough place to be um, a queer person all right so i'm done blathering so now I want like questions or thoughts or or whatever. I'm I'm reading the chat. Oh, I was talking to my RAs about this today. I was talk I was this is exactly the question. I was talking to one of my RAs and they're like, you know, you went to an all girls school? And I'm like, yeah, I did. And he's like, but you don't like believe in like girls as like a fine. And I'm like, I know, it's crazy, right? And and I tried to give a quick history to him because, you know, he's like 21 years old. Um, I was like, you know, they were really a thing for a while, especially for girls. That the data suggested that girls did better. There was, you know, they were more confident in class. There was less of a meat, a meat market atmosphere but that the data on boys didn't show the same effect. The data on boys was kind of equivocal. And so we used to joke that we always needed to sacrifice a few girls on the world to go to school with the boys so that they could like be normal. And then we could just have our own school and like do our own thing. So it was sort of just accepted that, you know, single sex schools are good for girls. And, but over the years, like we've seen a lot of single sex schools, you know, change and it's just the social climate is much more skeptical of that approach to education. And what's the justification and why and what about tradition blah, blah, blah. So, and so that's already happening in the culture. And then we have a little gender revolution. And people start like, like not even being able to talk about this anymore. Like, do you call it a single sex school? A single gender school? What is sex? What is gender? Like, what is the admission criteria? And some of the um, women's colleges like Mount Holyoke and Smith, like some of them had already begun to wrestle with this. You know, I, I think around like in the 2010s around then. But it's then it's sort of trickling down to the high school level. And there are certain inherent contradictions that there's kind of no way to get around, which is that 
if the whole kind of basis for the school is a is a binary category of gender, then like then how do you go about busting that out enough to accommodate trans and non-binary students? It's like, aren't we kind of, isn't it doomed from the start? Because if if you know you have to start with the gender, you know, binary. And and then whatever policy decision you make sounds like a judgment of whether you think gender is biological or social. Do you say, uh, we're all, we are a school for uh, girls who were born girls, however they identify now. We're gonna say that your status as a born girl is what matters. Alternatively, if you have an admissions criteria that says, we just care about whether you currently identify as female, we don't care what you were born, then you are inherently saying it's your social identity that matters, nothing else. So a school almost has no way to navigate without it meaning way too much. And, and that's when I think a lot of the debates happen. And I, you know, there's a lot of places where we're like, well, the, the truth is that you just don't, you know, decide. And then I think you get to the point of, then why are we a single sex school? Like, remind me again, like, it's like, what's, if we're all gonna agree that this is complex, that we don't actually know what it is about gender that matters, and we don't actually know what the difference between girls and boys is, or who we were ever talking about, if we're willing to say all that out loud, then isn't it a little weird that we have an all girls school? And, you know, I sort of feel like, you know, to the contrary, I'm like, you know, vive la difference. I'm like, no, it's like the capacity to have that conversation as a school that could potentially be the most sort of revolutionary and mind expanding thing. So I feel like I wish that um, we could wrestle with these complications without feeling that we are passing judgment on the Marlboro that we experienced or some, you know, I feel like it can be both and um, the way that Marlboro served our needs, you know, then and the debates it faces now there, you know, it is evolving and changing like all of us. And I don't think that means we have to throw out everything. But I think that middle path that they're actually trying to walk down of just like, you know, let us just open the doors and see, you know, and we'll, we'll work with this. It's probably the only, you know, thing for any school to do. But I also think it's possible that the Marlboro will come under increasing pressure, you know, in the next 20, 40, 60 years, that I'm sure there'll be a lot of pressure to go co-ed. I think we're in a historical era where there's more, you know, there's just, more confusion or discomfort or questioning about that. Yeah. And and I and I imagine that there are critics who would be like, well, that's just ridiculous. But you know, I I think that that's the way to go. That it's both and it's like we have created this space and our policies are that when you're here, you're fully here. And I love the example of pronouns because I do a lot of speaking to schools and sometimes to businesses about the value of pronouns. And what I say to them is it's a safety signal. It has nothing to do with you. It's a way of saying, I invite, you know, I invite all of you. It's a way of reducing uncertainty in the minds of the people who interact with you about how they can how they can expect to be treated. And that's what we all want to know in interactions. Are you a nice person? Right? So it's a safety signal. And it's probably the cheapest and most effective. Like it's like, wow, that little action can do a lot. Also, because I think in our contemporary cultural climate, if you have, you know, pronouns in your email signature, someone will assume, wow, if they're, if they're aware of gender diversity, they're probably going to be okay if I'm gay, right? So it, 
it sort of serves as a general like, I'm okay with sexual and gender diversity. I know that it exists. And so you don't have to be weird, you know, with me. And there are a lot of people who I think are so much more inclusive than they used to be. And so I would say, just make that clearer. Like no one can read your mind. Marginalized populations are always looking for cues of acceptance. And the more we can thread those cues into our daily interactions and just say, with me, you don't have to be hypervigilant. With me, you don't have to be like, <clears throat> you know, you're safe with me. You can bring your whole self. That's totally fine. And I would love for us to just embed that spirit in, um, in the way we organize our social worlds. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, does anyone else have any final questions before we wrap up? I just want to say thank you. I, I came in a little bit late and I'm sorry. I um, found this so valuable and I really, you know, I was looking and counting how many people were attending this and and I thought it would have been so easy to cancel this and say there just aren't enough people to make it worthwhile. But um, you've really given me a lot to think about. And I, I know it will impact how I move through the world and interact with people. And um, so I really appreciate that you went ahead with this. You just made my day, like, seriously, that, that's that's very moving. And Pam, this will be available on our YouTube channel and I will send it out to our alumni community. So anyone, we had, I, be, I believe about 60 people who registered for this and I did let people know just to register in case they do want the link so they can be on like a short list of emails. So more people will absolutely hear this talk and I agree, it had a huge impact on me and I'm just so grateful, Lisa, for you taking the time out of your day to have this. Uh wonderful conversation. Thank you for saying that because I was actually, our class has a Facebook page and I was saying, I'd really like to post the link to the recording on the Facebook page because I know that, um, you know, we're the class of 76 and kind of a transitional period culturally where there was growing awareness and lots of silence and, yeah. you know, and kind of both of those happening simultaneously mm -hmm. and, and I've had many conversations with classmates over the years who have, they're like, wow, now I'm grown up. And now I kind of, I look back and I think, oh, that's, that's what was going on. And I didn't understand and I didn't have the vocabulary and I didn't. Um, and so I think this would be a, a great, for our class, definitely a conversation starter. So thank you. And I believe Mary had a question. Yeah, I just, just a, well, more of a comment again, really to echo what Pam said and to thank you so much. I found this really uh, empowering. Um, I'm also actually locally based here in Salt Lake. So, oh my gosh, um, <laughs> which is, oh my gosh, we should get together. Well, oh you know, what's, what is so funny is I met you at a Roland Hall. Um, you spoke oh. at Roland Hall like five years ago, and yeah. I had no idea you were a member. Oh, my God. Really, that's fantastic. So, so, but I also wanted to know if you, um, if we could reach out directly to you. I'm sure like you're, Absolutely. you would, okay. okay. Absolutely. Here, I'll put my email. Here we go. Oh, um, here, I got it. You sent it to me directly, but it's okay. I oh, sorry. It. Okay. okay. <laughs> <That's everyone. laughs> oh. Thank you. Yeah, of course. And I actually, I believe um, we're trying to put it together that I may be speaking, you know, with some of the staff about gender diversity uh, in October, because I was going to be in town just visiting my sister and my mom. And, um, you know, because so many people have so many questions. And, you know, I feel like, you know, just be like, everybody calm down. <laughs> like, it's all going to be okay. I know the world is changing fast. 
I know you have questions. I have some answers. We're all just going to have some water and it's going to be all right. <laughs> Well, I think a lot of what you said too about being able to provide social safety is rooted in that confidence to be able to do that. And I think it, the more people that you can connect with, the more tools that you can share, um, yeah. especially on Marlboro's campus, but of course, beyond with all the amazing work you do globally, um, more people just feel confident. And even just reading some of your research and understanding social safety from that perspective changed my understanding of making eye contact and like how much meaning that can have to somebody um you know but at the same time sometimes I don't want to make eye contact because I feel like I look like <laughs> I don't want anyone to look at me but you know it could have a lot more meaning to somebody else getting eye contact than me having to dig deep to like provide that so just that one example but I think your work is yeah I think it's amazing and it just has so much impact I'm sure on so many people so thanks so much well, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone. I really Especially appreciate it. Especially my classmates. That you know <laughs> makes me. And I'm gonna be in town in in like like October 9th through the 13th. So I was gonna try and get in touch with some of my Marlboro buddies. So amazing. Yeah. Um, well, the alumni office is here to help facilitate that. If you ever need contact information, just public service announcement. But. Um, this recording will be available tomorrow. So thank you everyone for being here. I hope you all have a wonderful night. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Lisa. Thank you.